All right, Blondie. I had a lot of fun with you today. You're such a cutie pie. This is Blondie, and this is her roadmap to success. Um, and, uh, ooh, this nail is, this dew claw is way too long. It's about to become ingrown. Uh, they can actually, the nails can actually splinter, and you have to amputate the nail if you don't grow back. So this one is already rounded. It's about, I'd say about 85% of the way, making a circle. Oh, my God. So, um, we keep getting to see Alma today. I know we usually get our nails cut, but I wonder if they just... Well, you might want to get uh, find somebody who uses a Dremel. Um, a Dremel is like an emery uh, file on a, on a drill bit, and you can hold it up and... Zzz, that's what they do, okay. but she might have missed that because we've taken her regularly. Yeah, because... this is pretty long. And so you can make the quick go back. Yeah. Uh, but I would say, look, this is, and so this might be something you have to do every two or three days if it's somewhat close because it's not only, it's starting to uh, like ram horn or it doesn't do the full circle. It starts kind of overlapping oh, no. like this and making a cone. And when they get too long, they get fragile and they can splinter. I know a couple dogs who actually had to have the nails amputated. It's a surgery and it doesn't grow back. So uh, we just want to avoid that. Um, all right, so this is her roadmap to success. We talked about exercise. Now, she's not a super duper high energy dog. Yep, you don't like that, huh? Yeah, she's growling. She's saying, I don't like that. That's, growling is not aggression. It's important to never correct or disagree with the dog. She was saying, I don't want you to touch that, so what did I do? I stopped touching it. That's what she was looking to accomplish. She stopped growling. So um, we talked about exercise first. She's not a super duper high energy dog, but she could use more exercise. So um, feeding her out of a snuffle mat, getting an omega treat ball would be good uh, ideas. Um, oh, I forgot to go over the feeding and I'll go over that here in a second. Um, so basically what you wanna do is uh, using the dog's nose can be very draining for them physically. So um, on walks, let her sniff. Instead of thinking I gotta get back to the house, we're just gonna walk a certain duration. And once we get to halfway point, if I have 30 minutes, we're gonna walk for 15 minutes. Then I cross the street when we get to halfway point and come back and she gets fresh sniffs on the other side of the street. Um, and she can sniff as much as she wants. Do you wanna get down? It looks better if you're in the shot. Can you hang out for a little bit? It's like, we'll see. Um, all right, so um, letting her sniff on walks is really beneficial. Also doing scent games. Just Google scent games. You can just hide treats around your place and she's gotta use her nose to find them. That's very physical, uh, they're very beneficial. All right, if you wanna get down, all right, you wanna do that? Okay, you wanna rub your belly, is that what you're saying? Okay. Um, so um, also treat dispensing toys and puzzles are also a great way for her to eat her kibble. She has to use her brain to figure out how to do it. She feels like she earned the food. It slows down the feeding process and makes it uh, a beneficial uh, situation where it's stimulating, relaxing, and drains some energy. Now for feeding, uh, in the wild dogs spend 90% of their time looking for food, and the guardians here do what a lot of my clients do, is they leave the food out all the time, hoping that the dog will eat it. Uh, I don't eat Burger King, that stuff is nasty. But if I'm on a diet and I'm not allowed to eat Burger King, every time one of those commercials comes up, it looks delicious because I'm not allowed to have it. So if you leave food in her bowl for four hours, I eat whatever I want. Dogs eat in order of their rank, so making sure that you eat something before you feed her is important. But what I would do is I would put the food in the bowl, don't let her eat it, she probably won't be a problem at first. Then you eat something in five or more bites. You can't be a smoothie or coffee. They don't understand liquids as a food, and you can't fake it. They can smell cancer inside your body, so they can't fake eating. So get a chip, carrot, piece of celery, something like that. Eat it in five tiny bites, or you can eat a real meal. And then when you get done, give her permission to eat. And you call her, the, tap the bowl, and then when she comes over, she's on the clock. If she, once she, if she walks away, as soon as she walks away, pick up the bowl, dump it empty, put the empty bowl back down. It's important to put the empty bowl back down. If you take the whole bowl out, that's looked at as taking away your food. If you empty it, you're changing the state. In the wild, the food doesn't wait around for them. They don't have no refrigerator and no kitchen. So if they don't have a successful hunt or she goes, I don't feel like eating, I'm gonna walk around the block. When she comes back, she would, whoever's behind her in the portion in line is gonna eat her portion. So what we're doing is just really using what's natural for them. So go put the food down, you eat something first, then you call her over to eat. If she doesn't come within a minute, then I pick it up and dump it empty. Um, if she does come over and sniff it, she's on the clock. But as soon as she walks five paces away, I pick it up, dump it empty, and then she does not eat again until the next meal. Do not feed her. Uh, my parents' miniature schnauzer went three and a half days. She did not eat until breakfast till the fourth day. Whoever blinks first loses. Don't cheat, the hunger becomes your ally. Uh, and uh, I like feeding twice a day, and what I usually say when you're transitioning, sometimes they start eating late in the day. I only feed them dinner if they eat breakfast first. And so feed them a reasonable portion, uh, but just like us, if we get tired and we're hungry, we get a little cranky, so that might be a, a contributing factor as well. And also, dogs eat in their line, of their rank, so if you eat first each time, and then you control access to the food and all that rest of that, you're getting very fussy back here, aren't you? It's like, I wanna lay down the way I wanna lay down. You're not letting me do it the way I want. 
Um, so basically, if we uh, have dominion over the food, that really elevates us as authority figures. Um, and if he goes longer than three days, let me know, but that usually means somebody in the house is cheating for him. <laughs> um, all right, so we also talked about, uh, we also use the laser. Some dogs you should not use a laser for. She seemed to have a pretty healthy uh, interest in the laser. Uh, if your dog whimpers, whines, starts drooling, and things like that, I think your mom wants you in the shot, so I'm gonna put you back here. Um, and uh, so uh, if your dog whines, whimpers, or it doesn't seem healthy, then you shouldn't do it. But for her being able to have her run around the house would be really beneficial. If she likes to play fetch, fetch is a wonderful way to burn energy as well. We just wanna look for some creative ways for her to get that exercise. Also with the nails, one thing I, I forgot to mention, if it ro goes around too much, it can actually embed back into them and create an infection. So you don't have, you have time to get it taken care of now, but I would definitely get on it. Um, okay, we also talked about uh, dog psychology, how dogs learn. Remember, rewarding a dog by breaking a rule is very confusing for them. Dogs need consistency to figure things out. They go through life probing, waiting for you to say that's the line or that's the limit. And they're gonna circle back around and try it again later on and again and again, a certain number of repetitions before the dog's like, <clears throat> every time I get ready to go on the carpet, she disagrees. She doesn't want me to go on the carpet. I'm cool not to go on the carpet. And then what do we do? After a month, we're like, come on to the carpet as a reward. Reward her by giving her belly rubs, treats, teach her stuff, whatever you want to do. Just don't reward her by uh, breaking the rule. Also, um, uh, uh, building confidence in dogs can often be achieved by teaching them new tricks or commands. One of the things I'd like the guardians here to do is to make a commitment. Each one of them is going to teach her a new trick or command. Ideally, you'd like to try to do it each week. So uh, week one, I'm gonna teach her, and you can do something as simple as a circle. Hold the treat here, lure her around, and when she completes the circle, pop the treat in her mouth, say circle. I do this a lot with dog. I call it hurricane. I do this a lot with dogs that, I actually, the first time I did is a dog down a dog park down the street where this yellow lab kept on getting humped by the other dogs. And the guy got frustrated and the dog didn't like it, so we taught his dog to circle. Every time a dog would hump, he would, we'd have a circle no more than three times, the other dog would look for another dog that it could dominate or hump. And so that's a super duper easy one. It's a utilitarian portion to it. Yes. Uh, but uh, teach your dog bang your dead, roll over, uh, get me a, uh, fetch me a slipper. Uh, you know, uh, there's a whole bunch of stuff that you can teach her to do. You teach her to put all of her dog treats, uh, all of her toys in a, in a uh, basket. Um, so teaching her new tricks and commands can really boost her self esteem and confidence. So one week, if you can teach her a new trick or command, and then once she learns, roll over. For everything, you want to eat, roll over. You want to go to, out the door, roll over. You want to go, uh, get them, whatever it is, you got to roll over. By the end of the week, and come up with fun command words. I call it stunt dog, my dog rolls over. Um, so at the end of the week, then the other guardian would take over, and she goes to YouTube and finds another really easy dog trick, teaches uh, Blondie how to do it, then all week long, in order to do this, you got to bang your dad, bang your dad. And after a while, if you each do this for four tricks, at the end of two months, now you have eight new tricks or commands, which will really boost her self-esteem and confidence, but also gives you eight new ways to redirect her attention. I don't like the way that guest is looking. You know, a circle, oh, I'm doing a circle and I'm getting a treat. And you've completely forgotten about the guest. Um, we also talked about um, enforcing some rules consistently. And remember, these rules should be in place for at least three months. So the first rule I usually suggest is not allowing the dog on a furniture. She likes to get on the furniture. She's sometimes allowed, sometimes she's not, and that's confusing for the dog. So what I, and if she's nudging you, I would just not even engage. Don't move your hand away. Just, just leave your hand. Let her nudge a couple times. I would probably tell her to sit at that point. And if she continues to nudge me, then I would just nudge all you want. I'm not even moving my hands away. Um, all right, so uh, other rules when we're e uh, the gardens are eating, sh she should not be within seven feet of the humans who are eating. So at the dinner table, some people will actually make uh, put a little painter's tape around so you know exactly where the boundary is. Shouldn't be allowed in the kitchen where we're preparing food. Uh, the humans are going to eat something first. We're also going to make her sit before we go out of any door. Uh, this should be, well, I'm guessing you don't close the kennel door, correct? Um, so if you want to go out the back door, go to the door, tell her to sit one time. She has three seconds to sit. If she doesn't sit by the third second, walk away. If there's somewhere in the kitchen to sit down, wait for one minute. After one minute, go back to the door and command her again, sit. If she doesn't sit this time, I walk away for two minutes and sit down. Next time I sit down for four minutes, then for eight minutes, I keep doubling the length of time until eventually when I say sit, she sits. And as soon as she does, celebrate that. Uh, as soon as she does, great job of going under her chin. Um, both of the both of the guardians just they started to go on the top and they went underneath. That was great. It's going to take you a little bit of time to get in the habit of doing that. So remember, petting on top of the head creates a down nose orientation. Under the chin facilitates nose up. All things being equal, pet under the chin, but you can pet anywhere you want except for here. Um, all right. So um, uh, let me see. So for the door, uh, I go to the door and I say sit once. If she doesn't comply, she has to wait twice as long each time before she gets another opportunity to do it right. And as soon as she sits down, man, that door opens so fast you can't believe it. 
After a while, she'll sit as a way of saying, I want the door to open. Eventually, do it both directions. When she's outside, do it when she wants to come inside. You go to Starbucks or you know, um, Caribou Coffee or wherever you go, tell her to sit before you go through the door. Now we start and establish it here because if we go to Starbucks and say sit, she doesn't sit. Well, now I have to sit and wait here for, with you for one minute. Mm -hmm. She does it here, celebrate. Um, uh, we get to do this inside. She, if she doesn't sit, you just come and sit back in and watch a little TV or uh, read some articles or do whatever you want. You're in your home. It's nice or convenient or relaxed. Um, she's very relaxed right now. Um, okay, so um, those are some examples of rules, but look for other opportunities for rules. So if you want to go for a walk, you have to sit before I put the leash on you. Um, and, and I'm going to talk about coming home, but you can do the same thing for the leash. When a dog doesn't behave the way that I want, what I do is I create a situation where it's the easiest version of that task. And then I break the task or activity down to individual steps and help the dog practice the first step over and over and over again until they do it consistently. Only then do it in the next step. So one of the things that happens is when the guardians come home, she's very excited, especially one of the guardians who probably works, who works from home a lot. So basically, when you come home, if she's, she's all excited and you give her even talk to her, it's engaging, it's rewarding. Anything your dog is doing when you pet it or give it attention is what you're rewarding and validating, even if it's negative or bad attention. Bad dog. Oh, you're yelling at me. You're not yelling at her. I feel so awesome. So just, the best thing to do is ignore. So when you come home, if she jumps up on you, shimmy away. Don't let her jump up on you because that could be a way of claiming you. And then, and then just, and ignore her. Watch her out of the corner of your eye. But as soon as she settles down, then start reaching for her. And as soon as you re start reaching for it and she starts wiggling, getting excited. Remember, excited is not the same thing as happy. So as soon as she shows excitement, we pull back and we go back and do what we're doing. You might have 5, 10, 15, 20 iterations going back and forth. So you should expect you're only going to reach a little bit of the way. Don't think I'm going to be able to touch her. But So what we're saying is when you get excited, I lose interest. And when you get calm, I re-engage with you. And after a while, she'll start offering that behavior. But it takes a lot of repetition before dogs understand it. Guardians doing a great job of reinforcing. Uh, the only thing one of the guardians does is has a tendency to get very close to the dog's head, which she can do. There's nothing wrong with that, but I'd like her to do it uh, a little bit more sporadically. Um, uh, okay, so uh, those are examples of rules. Like I said, if you're if you're leashing her up, as soon as you start walking to where the leash is and she recognizes that, stop. If she gets in front of you, turn around and go sit back down. If she gets excited, just stop and go about doing what you're doing. Does she get really excited for the leash? So one of the things you can do for that is desensitizing her. So go through the leashing up process at times when you don't plan on taking her for a walk. Right now, what you have is an example of classical conditioning. You pick up the leash, it's guaranteed to walk excitement. That's what classical conditioning is. So now we pick up the leash, but as soon as you get excited, the leash gets dropped. And after a while, you'll, pick up, you'll be able to pick up the leash and see. So what I usually do is I walk to where the leash is, and she walks in front of me, I turn around and sit back down. I don't say no, I move away, I stop the process. And I had a guy in Los Angeles, in, uh, in the South Central, it took 45 minutes walking back and forth where the leash is before the dog figured it out. Next step is when we get there, I tell the dog to sit one time. If the dog sits within three seconds and I would start reaching for the leash, I'm not anticipating getting the leash, I'm just gonna start. If he doesn't sit within three seconds, I walk back to the couch and start again. Well, let's say the dog did sit, then I start reaching for the leash, and let's say the leash is right here. I reach this far and the dog gets up, I pull my arm back and I say sit. If the dog SITs, Remember, come up with a funny word for your dog bed as well, or your uh, kennel as well. If she if she sits within three seconds, I start again. If she doesn't, then I walk back. And so eventually, it gets to the point where first I can reach this far, then this far, then this far. Then I can actually touch it, and it gets excited, put it back down. Then I touch it and I jiggle it, make all the sounds, and then you know. And really, what I do is I, I'll say sit up to the first four times, not in a row, but I sit, sit, sit. And now I'm just gonna be like and I wait for the sit. You told the dog three, four, five times, now I'm just detracting, and then if you don't sit in the three second window, I walk away. So now it sit becomes the expected behavior. And then you eventually pick up the leash, pick it up and go and attach it to the dog's collar, and then you go to the door, and, and, she's not, and they tell her to sit again before you open the door, and if she sits, then at that point I take the leash off and go sit down. So it's like, oh, okay, it's just a drill now, evidently. And then sometimes you're like, you actually open the door and go out, but sometimes you just go to the door. Sometimes you open it and then the leash comes off. So she doesn't ever quite know when she's going to go for a walk, and after a while that helps her be less excited. Remember, excited is not the same thing as happy when it comes to dogs. Okay, um, if, she, if she go to the schmello? Schmello. So every time she goes to the schmello, make sure you pet her and say schmello. And if, you, if you're too far away, you can just say the word schmello. It's not as impactful if you get up and pet her and give her a treat, but it is reinforcing. Sit. 
So the guardian told her to sit once, she didn't sit, and the guardian did everything she's supposed to do. She just did, went back to doing what she's doing. Now the dog is like, but I wanted that attention. After she stops getting as much attention, I think she probably gets so much attention she doesn't really have to ask for it. But now, she, even if the guardians want to pet her, they're not going to do it unless she sits to earn it first. I call this petting with a purpose. So next time she nudges you or paws you or jumps in your lap, she's telling you what to do. Instead of validating that and, reward, and rewarding her, we're going to give her a counter order to tell her to sit. If she's already sitting here, ask her to sit over here or ask her to lay down. Better yet, tell her to sit or lay down. And if she has three seconds to comply, if she doesn't, remember, playing hard to get works great when you're dating. It works great for dogs too. So if you don't sit, then I got 23 other things to go, I got going on. I wanted you to make the top of my list, but you didn't want to do that. So now we're, I'm going to play Scrabble with my partner or we're going to watch TV or whatever it is. After a while, she'll get, well, I'm losing that reinforcement. So sitting wasn't that hard. And what will happen is she'll start sitting to prepay for the attention. When she does that, make sure you reach over and pet her under her chin. Say the word sit and only sit, not good sit. Remember, say just the, the first, word, first word. And then pet her as much or as little as you want. Um, if she prepays, same thing, pet her a little bit. And so you're recognizing, you're rewarding her, telling her this is something that gets my attention and my action. And the more that you do that, the more she'll start emulating those particular behaviors. And eventually that's what she'll do. Um, and uh, remember to use the watcher paycheck. If you, if you suspect someone's petting without a purpose, you say paycheck to them. Even if they did it right, they stop petting the dog, tell the dog to sit. When the dog sits, pet her on the chin and say sit. Say, so actually, I asked her to sit. When you stood up, she got up and I continued petting, but thanks for reminding me because I do forget to pet without a purpose. Um, kind, of, kind of a couple of good looking dogs on the TV right now. Um, sorry. Uh, so basically, uh, when we get to uh, uh, passive training, is rewarding the dog for voluntarily offering the behaviors that you want. Every time she goes to, to the little dog bed, the guardians here call it Schmello. So every time he goes there, pet her and say Schmello. Every time she goes into her uh, kennel, call it Mansion or Malibu or come up with a funny word that means to go there. Um, every time she takes her first bite of food, say chimichanga or sushi or pasta or whatever you want to call it. So after four months, every time I first get the first bite of food, I hear pasta. Now you're pasta. I run in the kitchen expecting to eat food. I put it, you put it in context for your dog. So um, every time she comes to you, pet her and say, come. Every time she sits, uh, lays down, name all your individual toys. Uh, you know, if she does weird things, she drinks water, call it Merlot if you like wine or whatever it is. Um, if she makes a grumbly sound that's not a growl, maybe you assign a marker for that. Um, she uh, goes to a certain sp special place. My dog lays down, I call it crash. Lay down on her side, I call that uh, flop. And so you can get that specific. When she licks you, call it kisses. When she licks you in your face, uh, my dog only licks me here because I have a beard. Guardians here don't have that problem. But if he licks you in the face, maybe you call that love. So eventually you say love, the dog runs up and gives you a little kiss on the cheek. Um, I have a little dog, Max, that I showed the guardians. I say hugs. When I say hugs, he runs up, jumps up on me, puts his paws here, and I, and I give him a pet. So it's kind of like a little doggy hug. And so all it is is for every time you do that on his own, I was, it was cold, I was warm, he jumped up and I petted him and say hugs. Now I can say it on command. So look for the things your dog does on a regular basis that are things that you like and come up with a command word for that. If you don't have one for potty, every time she potties, call it Trump or business or whatever, splat, whatever the word is you want to use. Um, even though she doesn't have potty accents, it's nice to be able to say, you got a Trump? And she goes, then you know, you got, she, she got to go outside. If you say Trump and she just looks at you like you're crazy, you're like, okay. Um, so putting things in context like that can really help. Um, all right, so petting with a purpose, passive training are really, really easy. The way they, the reason they work is because the principle, of the, uh, the quality or the uh, really repetitive properties, uh, I call it cumulative properties, thank you. Uh, and so uh, it, by itself, once is not going to be a big deal. But if you do it over and over and over again, it becomes really important um, and powerful. Now, the guardians here, uh, I think, usually have an audience when they use the loo. Um, I would like you to start either closing the door every time or leaving the door open but not letting her cross that threshold like I showed you with the kitchen. Remember to use those escalating consequences to disagree with her. Um, uh, hiss, stand, march, um, and after a while, hiss, stand, and then eventually just hiss. Um, remember, the hiss is before she does the wrong thing. Once she's done it, then you would just go to the second consequence. Um, I'm trying to think. Is there anything else we want to go over? The video above is going to be the click for looks, and I talked to the guardians about that off camera. So uh, let's talk about the, the stuff I talked about off camera that's not included in that video. So for dogs that she doesn't like, what I'd like you to do is arrange, if you know the handler, go to a park somewhere, not a dog park, a regular park, preferably with not a lot of craziness going on, and just sit down with her, have your clicker, and have some treats, and as soon as she, and have that other dog just walk circles around you. And have them start at like 25 feet. 
and then go to 24 feet and gradually get that circle a little bit smaller. If you get to the point where she won't take the treat, then take note of what that distance is and that's where you need to continue practicing, maybe a foot beyond that. We want her to be able to take the treat. Remember, if she won't take the treat or won't sit down, that's her indication she's getting ready to strike or to explode. The whole point of this is we don't want her to react at all. Also remember, slow moving is a big indication that she's about to strike or disagree. She did it, almost once, did it once for me. We recognize that we stopped. But now that you know that, and you can tell your, your uh, uh, friends that come over, if you see her start to move in slow motion, just immediately stop and then ask us for a treat. And then what you can do is, you, and what you should do is when you have friends that are over here, if you're, I'm gonna talk about the tether in a minute, but basically just, uh, just say, okay, if you're gonna get up, please let us know first. Hey, I'm gonna get up. Okay, pull a little piece of treat, give her the piece of the treat. Okay, stand up, they stand, and then they just freeze. Okay, and then I'm gonna go to the bathroom. All right, give another treat, maybe a bigger one. Okay, go ahead and walk to the bathroom. So now everything that she would normally disagree with, she gets a treat first and then the person doesn't. When the does, person does move, they should try to move fluidly, like they're underwater. Sudden movements and loud noises and extorts are gonna cause her to react. And so whenever possible, they're gonna get up, they should probably, <coughs> And then and you give the treat, and then they slowly get up. We don't want to ever think that we're trying to get one by on her. Um, also remember to practice the drop when she has things in her mouth. Quietly pull out a treat, hold it here, wait for a drop to pop in her mouth, say drop, and don't pick up the object. Getting back to the guest. What I would recommend is when you have guests come over, first of all, meet outside. So I'd have the guests call or text you when, you come, uh, when they come here. One of you goes outside with, uh, and grab like about five or six of these treats, tear them into quarters, and then start making a little treat trail. And make sure those sidewalks somewhere that doesn't have trees and uh, stuff that she, or uh, leaves and stuff she's gonna get confused with. Put it right in the middle or wherever the consistently. And if you put it consistently in the same spot, after she does this well, she'll know where to go look and she'll follow the path. She should go, we're kind of close to a corner. So what the idea is, we don't want her to see the person right away. So it'd be nice if they're kind of maybe on strand um, or whatever that street is. Um, and so she comes out, she gets a couple of trail of treats, and then she gets closer. As she gets closer, I usually have the treats a little bit closer together. At first, I keep them about a foot and a half apart. Um, after a while, then she's like, gets a treat, 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 and then she meets the person. And the person should not try to pet her, talk to her, look at her. They should ignore her completely. And then basically what you're going to do is walk where it's human, dog, human. So she's in between the two of you. And she keeps on trying to get away. Have that person move slightly away from you, increase the distance until she'll walk between you. Um, ideally, what we'd like to do is get out there where she gets a trail of treats and she meets the person and then we go for a little mini, mini walk and at some point on the mini walk, the, hand, the guardian here is going to hand the guest the leash. And so they're the one handling her. When they come through the door, remember, uh, I forgot to tell you this, uh, the, whoever's in front should be in charge. So when you come back here, all of the humans should come in first, she should come in last. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, basically, once she's in here, you could tether her to like your cabinet over there. What I would do is get a piece of cardboard, you know, look for like a, somebody getting a TV box or something like that. Cut it in half so the box will be like this. You can, if this is the box, you can open it like this way. So make it like kind of a wall that's maybe about two feet high and kind of uh, you know, sequester it over there. Now, something else you might want to get is an X pen. You can get these on Amazon for about 20, 30 bucks. It's just a foldable 24 inch uh, panel. There's eight of them you could create a little barrier. You don't even have to tether her there and the guests can't get to her and she can be over there with her uh, schmello and some other stuff and also get bully bites. Natural, the natural dog company is the one that I get. Make sure you get the low odor, odor free and give her one of those and she'll shoot me over there. Now, if she's getting up and barking and reacting and rushing the fence, then we might go back to the, uh, use that you should be an indication that we use a click for looks and all the rest of that stuff. And you might even still put the cardboard against the side of it so she can hear us talking and not see if the person gets up and goes to the kitchen or whatever it is unless they come close enough to her and she can see over that wall. But yeah, the way that your room is set up, that makes a nice little dynamic area for her to do that in. And that way you're, you're comfortable and you know she can't get to your guest and you relax. If you're tense and you're stressed that she might nip your guest, you can cause that because she's going to say, we were relaxed until the guest came and then that's when my humans got a little bit worked up. So the idea is to set her up for success. We want her to practice not reacting. So that click for looks, I think, is going to be really, really helpful. Meeting outside will be really helpful. This is not forever. After a while, we're hoping that eventually, after that, she's met that person outside five or six times, when they come in, uh, and ideally, I forgot the uh, last little bit of that. At first, the first time, you should all walk together. 
But after the second time, she goes pretty easily. It'd be nice if they just come over and eventually just come up and you hand the leash and they take her out for a little five or 10 minute walk and then come back to your house. They come in your house and they're doing a separate of you. So now she builds up a positive association with these people. She likes walks and give her a couple of treats. Ask her to ask him to ask her to sit. And if she sits, give her the treat and say sit. If she doesn't take the treat, that's not unusual not to be, unex not to be uh, unexpected or I wouldn't be surprised if that was the case. But after she needs to know these people, she should be more interested in taking the treats over and over again. So try to avoid feeding her before people come over so she's got more, uh, more leverage. Uh, they have more and more motivation for her. Uh, all right, is there anything else you want me to go over? Any separation anxiety when we leave her? So, okay, so for separation anxiety, um, I'm gonna, I'm gonna be. I'm gonna uh, give you the easy answer. If you go to my website, doggoneproblems.com, click on where it says dog training tips. That's where I put videos like this and all these other videos, other write-ups. My title, the subject for each write-up is gonna be what the tutorial video is. Then I always have a roadmap to success like this. So look for one that says separation anxiety. What I do is I desensitize the dogs to the triggers. I help the dog practice being alone by teaching it to stay and then having it stay while I go to get a glass of water, use the bathroom, and change clothes or whatever it is, and gradually get longer and longer until you can get the dog to two hours. Now, usually, well, I've been telling people for years, once your dog can do it for two hours, they never have to go up beyond that. Now, your dog might be starting to get worked up before two hours, and it's just around two hours is the tipping point. But the idea is eventually it gets to the point where you put her in a sit-stay in your bedroom and come out here and watch TV for a half an hour, and she stays there by herself. So she's staying in between, somewhere between zero access to you and 100% access to you. Once you got to the point where she can do that consistently, then you leave and then turn around and come right back. And then you leave, say a little bit longer, a little bit longer. The mistake most people make is they go for five minutes to 20 minutes or one, uh, to five seconds to five minutes. It's, so when you're doing this, you shouldn't actually leave. You should just go right outside your door. Have your iPad, your tablet or whatever, watch a little TV, do some work, have a cocktails, whatever it is. So that if she does freak out, you have a camera so you can watch her. So, and, and do a stopwatch every time you leave. So you know, so if you look at the camera, she starts pacing or marking. You look at your camera, you know exactly how long that was. We need to recreate that situation and practice a little bit preceding that, a little bit less time. We can also set her up for success by exercising her ahead of time, giving her bully sticks like that. Now, those things are gonna be band-aids. They're not gonna fix your problem. It's really practicing uh, increasing the distance and helping her practice staying, not necessarily on you. So the guardian who's here, Teaching her, if the guardian's working right here, it'd be nice to have her stay over there or in the bedroom with the door open while the guardian works for 20 minutes, 30. Use it when you're on your day-to-day -day thing. When you're like, okay, we're gonna practice, stay. Stay. I'm waiting for you to stay. I'm, now I'm waiting for the stay. If I'm watching TV and she's right here, stay. It's like, I'm staying here anyways. What are you talking about? That's the same result. And so we, the idea is we wanna practice having her do that and then stay when you go to the bathroom. And if you go to get a glass of water, giving her a practical, uh, using a stay as a practical applicator, and then you go do something, and the world, she'd come back to so the world didn't end. But you have to help her practice being alone in the easier capacity, which is when you're home. I'm guessing when you're here on the computer, she's right next to you, and you're petting her and typing at the same time, or watching video, or whatever you're doing. Mm -hmm. And so that kind of a nurture, she doesn't have any practice of being alone. And not only being alone, but being calm while she's alone. So watch those videos. If we need to, we can set up a one-hour follow-up session and work specifically on that. I don't think you'll need to, but if you need to, let me know. Um, now, if you have any questions, uh, can you grab her for me, by the way? Um, if you have any questions, make sure you text me. Um, you can call me as well, or you can email me, but I get about 100 emails a day, and uh, text. And I'm getting blown up with a lot of telemarketers these days. What a cutie pie you are. And so if I don't recognize the phone number, it might take me a day or two before I get to it. Text messages, I'll see you right away. And so make sure you let me know that way. Uh, I don't care if it's seven years after I worked with you. If I, haven't, uh, if I don't hear from you, I assume that means everything's going great. What do you say? Blondie, you're such a cutie. This is Blondie, and this is Blondie's roadmap to success. She's very relaxed, as you can see. Remember, everything you do trains your dog, only sometimes you need it.